Well, I am so delighted and I'm so honored to be here. I commend everyone in this room for what you're doing. I, I don't think that there's any group that is more worthy of respect on this planet than parents. And I want you to know that I have a great deal of honor for each one of you here. You are supporting your children, you're loving your children, and you're doing everything you possibly can to ensure that they have um, a successful education and um, a preparation for life. So please know I have a shout out to each one of you. So, um, but thank you so much for having me here. You know, it was once said that life affords no greater responsibility, no greater privilege than the raising of the next generation. And you are doing just that. An essential part of that raising is teaching our children how to get along with other people. Another person once said the most important single ingredient in the formula of success is knowing how to get along with other people. And so tonight we're going to be looking at one of those essential um, aspects of that formula and that is getting along with others, even in conflict situations. When I was young, from the earliest years, I always wanted to be a teacher. I can't remember a year that I didn't want to be a teacher. And when I was five, my parents gave me a blackboard and white chalk. Now that dates me, because blackboards and white chalk are no longer on the market, I'm sure. But at any rate, they gave me that for Christmas. And from that moment on, my life course was set. I grew up, uh, graduated from high school, went to college, and earned my degree in elementary education. And from there, I had the privilege of working as a second grade teacher. And I love all children, but I tell you, I think second graders are about as good as they get. <laughs> so, so. But um, I was able to work as a second grade teacher and then a school counselor, and eventually I had the privilege of even homeschooling my own children. I observed, though, in those settings that academics was not the main problem in my students' lives. Relationships were. Whether or not it was in public school where I worked or in our home school as I taught my own children, relationships were fragile at times and they, there was a lot of conflict that we had to work through. When teachers referred children to me for counseling, it was typically because of things like poor work habits or behavioral issues, failing grades. But I, I noticed that the underlying issues that were even more significant were the social and emotional struggles that many kids were having in school. I don't know about you, but I remember those years of junior high. And I don't always remember them with the finest, <laughs> finest memories either. They were hard years. And um, a lot of our kids are struggling at, those, at that time. The students that I worked with often lacked integrity. They lacked self-respect. They lacked a sense of self-control. They had little awareness of what they were feeling inside, and they had even less awareness how they affected other people in their lives, whether or not other children or even their family members or parents or siblings. They would often resist personal responsibility, and they were regularly experiencing conflict with others. And as conflict ruled their lives, their relationships and their schoolwork suffered. As a result, some of the students with whom I worked experienced little success in school. And I felt really sad about that because the kids that I worked with were precious children. And I truly, I loved each and every one of them. Now, why is it important to teach peacemaking to children? Well, first of all, it's important because conflict is everywhere. It's, it's inevitable in this life. Children experience it and they observe it, sometimes in their homes, often at school with their friends. They see it on TV, they see it in movies. They, in fact, if they happen to walk through a room and the news is on, they, can ha they can't help but they hear conflict. And that's a sad thing, the, the, the example that we're teaching them. But so many of our kids just do not know how to process it. They haven't had enough experience yet to know what to do with some of that. 
They take the effect of conflict to school with them in the morning. They bring it home after school in the afternoon. And they're like little emotional volcanoes sometimes that are waiting to erupt. But you know what? I think that can be said of us as adults sometimes too, can it? I know it's true of me. I want to show you a video clip in just a moment, and it's from a movie called Pizza Boy. Now, I haven't actually seen the movie, but this clip is really poignant, and it, it illustrates what I'm trying to say. I want you to watch as Adam Sandler's pent-up anger over something that happened at work causes a very painful conflict between him and his children. And it shows a very typical experience. We take our emotions out on other people when those people have nothing to do with what we're really feeling. So just watch this for just a moment. venture to say, venture a guess here, that it's probably happened in every home that's represented in this room, including mine. There are times when our fights and quarrels take control of us. They're fueled by our emotions, and those emotions hijack our ability to think sometimes. We can't process what is going on in, in, in our lives, and then we take those emotions out on somebody who comes with a little cute drawing, and we tell them it's stupid, and you've got to grow up. Now, how painful is that at times? And, and I know, we've, we've all done it. We need to help our kids understand that, that, that they have the ability to be able to control those emotions so that they can get along with others in a constructive and a, a respectful way. But our, our emotional expressions of choice sometimes can be angry outbursts. But those angry outbursts of tempers are not just ours. They happen to our kids, too. And yet we want them to be patient with our outbursts, and yet how patient are we with theirs at times? My students' academic problems were typically related to relationship issues in their lives and that consumed so much of their time, damaged so many of their relationships, and often left them feeling lonely and miserable in their lives. And today, sadly, social media is adding a lot to that problem, mainly because of social bullying on, on um, that, uh, that, what do I want to call it? Platform, very good, thank you. <laughs> in the early 80s, excuse me, early 90s, my husband uh, published a book on peacemaking. And it was about how to bring peace back into relationships that had been broken by conflict. And as I read it, I thought, that is what my students need. I was really excited about it. So I started using peacemaking as a foundation of my counseling methodology with my students. I, did it, I used it with individual students. I used it with group counseling. I even taught it in classrooms for social and emotional learning. And I promoted it with parent-teacher conferences, too. And what I found was that the results were stunning. Peacemaking is really a powerful tool for helping our kids. Uh, children learn to resolve conflicts on their own, 
and build healthier relationships with one another. And that helped help them even to develop academic growth, mainly because they weren't having to deal with conflict so much, they had more time to learn. Parents and teachers started reinforcing these principles at home and at school. And as we all began to, sit, to speak the same language about conflict, kids were benefiting, homes were benefiting, schools were benefiting. Parents noticed that kids were much more respectful at home more often and not quite so argumentative. And teachers would set up peace tables in their classrooms where kids could go and actually resolve conflicts on their own because they knew how to do it and they knew where to go to do that. Teachers reported that there were fewer disruptions in their classrooms, so they did have more or less time that they had to intervene in conflict, so they had more time that they could focus on teaching lessons. Everybody was finding it very helpful. In fact, I was walking down the hall one day in school, and one of my friends who taught first grade came running up to me. She said, I've got to tell you what just happened at recess. She said, two of my little students, again, six-year-old girls here, Two of my little students were outside and they were fighting over who got to be, be on the swing first. And as I was heading over to, to intervene, I heard one of them say, wait a minute, stop, we've got to do peacemaking. And the other little girl stopped and they both confessed to one another that they had done something wrong, that they were both selfish and demanding and they, all, they, wanted, their, they wanted their turn at the swing first. One of the little girls said, I'm so sorry, you go ahead and go first. And the other little girl said, I'm so sorry, you can go first. And eventually, they had another conflict over who got to go first, but um, not really. But anyway, the, the teacher was so thrilled. She did not have to intervene in this conflict. You know what, if six-year-olds can do it, we can do it. And that's the hope that we have. If children could not resolve conflicts, then they were able to ask if they could come in and see me as a counselor. And we would do what they called problem solving. Now my rule, when they came into my, into my office, they knew my rule because I had taught classrooms and uh, all of these peacemaking skills. But they knew that they had to, um, to confess before they could confront. So they had to take responsibility. Each of the children had to take responsibility for what they did before they could actually tell somebody else what they did wrong. What was amazing about that was that the confession usually eliminated the need for the confrontation. It was amazing. Children forgave one another. We then started to work on developing an action plan for what they could do differently the next time. They left my, my office arm in arm planning the next um, exciting event at recess. You know, so it was really a, a, a thrilling thing for all of us as adults in that school to see. I would go home every day and I'd tell my husband about all of these amazing little children who were applying peacemaking to their, con to their conflicts. And he was in awe. He was trying to do this with adults and he wasn't having quite the success that I was. So <laughs> it was really a thrill for, for me to see these little children embrace these principles and use them. Ken encouraged me to write a book so we could multiply the effect of, the, of these principles. And so that's where um, the young peacemaker came from. The first one I did was the Christian version called The Young Peacemaker. A few years after that was published, I worked with the Center of Youth Issues in, in Tennessee to revise The Young Peacemaker um, so it would be appropriately used in public schools and secular settings. And that is this version called the Peacemakers in Training. These principles, in fact both of those particular resources have been used in public schools, private schools, Christian schools, home schools, and even church programs, church youth programs around the world. But the thing that absolutely takes me to my knees is the fact that they have been used in high security prisons in the United States, in Mexico, and in South America. Drug lords and terrorists have gone through the young peacemaker and peacemakers in training. And when I see pictures of their graduating classes from those prisons, I am so amazed. These are adults. 
that had, had done things that their lives could have been ruined forever. And yet in a high security prison, they learned a different way. Your children can learn the same way that they can deal with their conflicts. And there is great hope for kids because of that. Now these resources are designed to teach children to understand what conflict is and where it comes from, how they can respond to it in a constructive way, and then even how they can prevent the conflict in the future. You have a handout that covers all 12 lessons. And then you have been given the, acti the student activity booklets for the peacemaker in training that you can, um, I think you already have copies of those. But you have my permission to make more copies for your children if you'd like to. I just want this used. My desire is for children to learn how to develop stronger relationships and more loving relationships with you and with other people in their lives. I want to see them successful in school and I want to see them mature into um, responsible and productive adults. And I want to tell you about a story about a little girl that I worked with. Libby was a second grader, but Libby could have been a fifth grader, she could have been an eighth grader, she could have been an eleventh grader. The, the things that I'm going to describe to you that Libby was struggling with are things that we all dis d struggle with at times. But Libby refused to complete her assignments. That's why she was referred to me as, as a counselee in school. She, or if she did do them, she did them poorly and she was failing by the end of October, her second grade year. So things were not looking very, very promising for the rest of her school, school year. She was disobedient to the adults in the, in the school and she was disrespectful to everyone, students and adults. She seemed unhappy, sullen and withdrawn. And her teachers were very, very concerned about her. Her emotions often hijacked her brain and she would explode into angry, hurtful outbursts at times. She was inclined to bully, which made her not very well liked by the other students. And she took things that didn't belong to her and she damaged other people's property. Her mother said the behaviors at home were consistent with what we saw at school. Libby felt so lonely. She felt rejected. She felt pretty hopeless. And all of that affected her ability to make good choices. I want to show you another video clip because this, just, this shows you, this illustrates what Li uh, Libby's life was like. This is a video clip from a movie called Inside Out and it's a Pixar movie where we see little emotions in, in children, in a child's brain and in a father's brain and in a mom's brain um, and how those emotions end up hijacking the little girl and the dad and it led to an unpleasant interaction with one another and, um, and a hurtful reaction. Uh, that age. <laughs> we went through that a few times. Um, plus she's always given me permission to say that too so I would never want to do anything to hurt her but anyway. But that, that looked like Libby. That was Libby's life. This is how she, how she interacted with just about everybody. If anybody challenged her it was push away and storm off. I began working with Libby weekly and I started teaching her basic principles of peacemaking. First, we focused on what conflict is and where it comes from. 
Webster's Dictionary defines a conflict as simply a clash between hostile and opposing elements or ideas. And I would like to add opposing desires. Our desires rule over us at times. And when we don't get what we want, we can blow. And it really can become ugly at times. Another definition that I like is that a conflict is a quarrel or a fight between people who think, believe, speak, or act differently. Now, when people are in conflict, they usually end up on what we call the slippery slope. And all the slippery slope is, is a way for you to see the three different responses to conflict. One is to escape. Just get out of there as fast as you can. Another is to attack. And the third is to stay on top of the slippery slope by working out the conflict. Let's look at the, at the escape zone a minute, also known as the peace faking zone. An escaper is the type of person who denies that a conflict exists. It's like having an elephant in your living room. Everybody walks around it and nobody even addresses the fact that it's there. Okay? We pretend that it's not even a problem. When that happens, bitterness, anger, resentment are still bubbling inside, but we're not dealing with it. If it becomes too big and we know we have to at least acknowledge that there's a conflict, we'll usually blame somebody else, try to escape the consequences of it, or we will run away from unpleasant conversations or unpleasant people or situations. Now, if that doesn't work, sometimes we'll go on the attack and we'll flop to the other side of the slippery slope. An attack zone is also known as the peace breaking zone. An attacker will put people down. They'll make fun of somebody else. They'll mock, they'll ridicule, they'll demean, they'll call names. They hurt people with their words or even sometimes with their fists. They'll gossip, they'll slander. They'll engage sometimes in verbal or physical fighting. Neither of these two zones, the escape or the attack zone, is going to resolve a conflict or strengthen a relationship. But the work it out zone can. In the work it out zone, that's known as the peacemaking zone. Peacemakers know when to overlook an offense. Now that's different than denying it. Okay, denial says, Conflict? What conflict? I'm not in a conflict. Do you have a conflict? Uh -uh, not me. We're all, hey, I'm fine. When all along, you're not fine at all. But um, overlooking an offense simply means that you acknowledge in your mind that a conflict does exist, but you're willing simply to refuse the bitterness, the anger, the resentment that's built, that would have a tendency to build up and you just simply forgive the offense, not even worry about bringing it up. This is advantageous because it can help you avoid unnecessary offenses, unnecessary conflicts. Now, if a conflict is too bad though, really too deep, too painful to overlook, then it's going to be important to pursue personal peacemaking. And that's where you try to talk it out with the other person. That's what those two little six-year-old six girls did on the playground. They tried to talk it out, and they came to a good conclusion. The co a couple of the things that have to um, be part of this talking it out in this personal peacemaking section is a humble confession. Simply admit to what, what, what went wrong, what, what we did wrong. Second thing is a loving confrontation that says, you know, this is how I felt when you did this to me. Um, and then a gift of genuine forgiveness. And we'll talk about that uh, confession and that forgiveness aspect in just a few minutes. Conflict brought out the worst in Libby. She was, she was really hurting. And so many of our conflict sessions, excuse me, counseling sessions, focused on learning how to stay on top of that slippery slope and trying to work out the conflicts that she was in. One of the things that helped Libby was to understand where conflict came from. Now Libby's fights and her quarrels were often triggered by her desires of battle within her. 
She wanted her own way, and when she didn't get it, she blew up with anger and frustration. She didn't want to do her work at times, so she felt a fear of failure that drove her to resist, hide her papers, and just not, not do anything <coughs> Excuse me, in school. She didn't want to be corrected, so she would argue and resist and debate with her teachers. Her desires ruled over her like little invisible puppeteers who jerked her this way and that way and this way and that way. I call those little, little feelings and emotions that she had her monster desires because that's what they look like sometimes in Libby's life. When emotions rule our brains, our brains will just simply shut down and we cannot think. So we, we act without thinking. And even a good desire that we elevate to a demand, that too can become a monster desire that will produce reactionary emotional outbursts. And that happened in our home school a lot. There were times when I wanted, our, I wanted to teach our, our kids a grammar lesson. They weren't too interested in learning grammar sometimes. I wanted them to do their chores. Eh, they would much rather play. I wanted respectful, cheerful obedience. But they would resist and debate with me. You know what that did to me? I got angry sometimes. And my, my voice got sharp, my words got sharp, and I cut them with that, with that tone of voice. I reacted to their, to their resistance. And I caused a conflict, they, caused, they contributed to the conflict too. So when our brains were seized by our emotions, our school day came to a screeching halt. Now, I don't know if any of you in here are homeschoolers, but if you are, you probably know what I mean. We were more interested in pleasing ourselves at times than we were in loving and respecting one another. Now, because of our human nature, everyone struggles with some level of monster desire at times, and they usually result in negative consequences. What I tried to teach Libby was that every choice that everyone makes is deliberate and personal. And we all are responsible for them, as well as for the consequences that we get from them. This was really hard for Libby to grasp. Like one of her parents, she blamed everyone else for the problems that she had in her life. They were always somebody else's fault. So in her mind, nothing was her fault. So she didn't deserve any consequences. It's everybody else who should have gotten them. We worked weekly for, for weeks and weeks to change this narrative. And eventually, I was so proud of her, she finally got it. She finally got it. And she began to accept that she did make consequences, excuse me, she did make choices. And those, those choices were things that she was responsible for. And just like her choices belong to her, the consequences for those choices also belong to her. Depending on, on Libby's choices, her consequences could be a positive blessing or perhaps a negative discipline or, or a punishment. It could be from an external source, like a teacher or a parent or even a friend. Or it could be internal, feelings that she felt when she did well or when she did poorly. They could be immediate, or they could be delayed. They could be natural, or they could be artificial consequences. And let me explain the difference between those last two. A natural consequence would be like this. If Libby just decided she wasn't going to study for her spelling test, nope, not going to do that, thank you very much, and she goes to take the test the next day, she's probably going to fail the test, right? So that would be a natural consequence for not studying. But an artificial consequence might be something like this. She's on the playground, she kicks the ball, it goes out into the street, and she, start, she runs out into the street without looking to see if any cars are coming. So the teacher sees that, she brings Libby back, she says, please stand on the wall for a time out, think about what you need to do before you run out into the street to get a ball. You have to, think, you have to make sure that you're looking for cars so you don't get hit. The artificial consequence is to try to prevent a worse natural one down the road. Does that make sense? Okay. So those are the types of consequences that Libby might, might expect. They're predictable. But as adults in our children's lives, we need to make sure that the consequences that we give them 
are reasonable, they're respectful, and they're restorative. The purpose of giving consequences is to restore them to a good place, to good choice making, good decision making. Harsh, abusive, and exasperating consequences do absolutely the opposite of what we want for our children. They create bitterness and resentment and anger toward us. And they usually don't find, um, find a way to make a good choice themselves. But instead, a consistent, loving discipline that we give them, administered in a wise and respectful way, can help children to make much, many better choices. And they can feel even more loved and more secure. That's our, our job, our responsibility, is to give those consequences in a loving way. Libby began to accept that if she wanted good consequences, then she needed to make good choices. And we used a consequence chart that you probably see in your handout to contrast her good and her bad choices. So if she ignored her schoolwork, she was probably going to get bad grades. If she didn't clean up her room, her mom wasn't going to give her the allowance so she could have the money to put into her bank um, to collect for a, a bike that she was saving for. If she bullied people, kids were probably going to reject her and not want to be around her or play with her. On the other hand, if she finished her homework and did it well, tried to, to put forth a lot of effort in it, did it neatly, tried hard to get it as accurate as she could, then she was probably going to get a better grade on her assignment. If she cleaned her room, she would get the allowance and that she could put that toward her bike. And if she treated people respectfully, she could enjoy close friendships with other people. And Libby began to understand that the only way to get those good consequences was to, get, it was to do the good choice. And because we had it on paper, she could see it. And then we would talk about that all the time. Libby learned that she did not have to fear authority or consequences when she did what was right. Now one thing that as adults we need to understand when we're giving consequences to our children, threats and promises are not consequences. If we say we're going to bless our children and do something really good for them because they, and, and we connect that to a choice they make, then we need to follow through with that. If they make a bad choice and we tell them that this would be the consequence and we need to make sure that we follow through with that. Now there were times when, when our children would confess and it was a sincere confession. And even though I said, if you, if you make this choice, then this will be your consequence, there were times when I would sit them down and I would say, I appreciate your sincere confession. I appreciate the fact that you are trying to change this right now. And instead of giving you justice, I'm going to choose to give you mercy. Now, it wasn't that I just didn't give them a consequence. They knew that their consequence was forgiveness. It was, it was mercy, and that they did not have to, to have the consequence that they deserved, in a way. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, too. But um, as for giving consequences, just make sure that when, you, when a child makes a choice, they get the right kind of consequence, and make sure that the child did that, did the choice before the consequence is given. I have to tell you, there were times when I would give the wrong child either the blessing or the discipline in our family. They weren't real happy about that at times. And I don't blame them. I needed to do a better job of, of making sure that I knew who did what. But like most of us, Libby was inclined to play the blame game when she made bad choices. She was thinking that if she, if she just blamed somebody else, that she, would in, she could avoid the conversation, she could avoid the consequence, and she wouldn't be in trouble anymore. Because remember, she didn't do anything wrong, so of course she didn't deserve a consequence, was in her mind. Okay? The problem with the blame game is that it always made Libby's problems worse. And it shackled her to the victim trap, which not only affected her emotional and her relational well-being, but also her physical well-being. You know, there's a lot of studies done that show that a victim mentality leads to poor physical health, leads to increased stress and anxiety, 
in children and adults, and depression and even addiction, not to mention academic and relational failures. Apart from the addiction aspect, Libby suffered from all of those things, and she played the blame game in five different ways. She would blame others for the choices she made, and she'd say things like, well, she made me push him. It's her fault. Or she'd try to cover up what she did. One time she ripped pages out of a library book and hid the library book, hoping that her teacher and, or, and the librarian wouldn't find out. They did. She would make excuses for her choices. Well, I couldn't help but that I couldn't turn my work in today. I, I couldn't really give you my math paper, Miss Nelson, because, well, my sister spilled juice on it, and I, 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 you know, I just couldn't help it. It was her fault. It's not mine. She would pretend that she did nothing wrong, or else she would just tell a bold-faced lie. I didn't scribble on your, on your grade book, Miss Nelson. It wasn't me, when it really had been. If we sum up the blame game with one word, it's deceitful. And lies always are going to magnify a conflict. They're going to destroy a relationship. They're going to affect school performance and even perpetuate a victim mentality. When children like Libby are caught in, a victim, in this victim trap, you will usually hear them say things like, you know, nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Or, I can't help it. It's not my fault. Yeah, I hit him. But he hit me first. And this guy couldn't help it. And I love this one. As a second grade teacher, I heard this occasionally. My teacher doesn't like me. She gave me an F on my spelling test. <laughs> During our sessions, I would not let Libby blame. She couldn't, I, I just wouldn't listen. And if she blamed other people, I'd say, Libby, our session is done for today. We'll try again next week. The fact is, she liked coming to, to visit with me, to talk with me. So eventually, she kind of got it, that she couldn't blame when she came into my office. What was exciting to me was I saw that victim mentality start to change. Libby adopted a new vision, a vision of victory, of real victory. She could refuse to play that blame game. She could start taking responsibility for choices that she made. And she could even start making better choices. She could experience freedom, and she could grow in confidence. And that happened in Libby's life. Libby could succeed instead of fail, no matter what anybody else said and no, what it, no matter what anybody else did. She was starting to take hold of the fact that she was a responsible person. And she was starting to feel much, much better about herself. Now what about us? What about us as parents? Are we living as victims? or victors? What might we be teaching our children by examples? Are they learning to take responsibility and make smart choices from us? Or are they learning to play the blame game? Now you might say, well, I'm not teaching them anything about this stuff. But the truth is we are always teaching our children something because our children are always watching us. No matter what their age is, they're watching us. And what we need to start wrestling with a little bit is what are we teaching them and what do we want to teach them? Libby learned that if she was going to resolve conflicts, and restore relationships. She had to be honest about what she did and what she said. She needed to take responsibility for those things. And that's exactly what she started doing. We told our children when they were growing up that everybody makes mistakes. Everybody makes wrong choices at times. But not everybody admits it. And not everybody stri strives to change. 
the difference, and that is the difference between childishness and maturity. A couple weeks ago, my little seven-year-old grandson, whom I adore, was hanging out with Nana and Papa at our house. And he, I was in the kitchen, and, and Drew came running in the kitchen. He said, Nana, Nana, I'm so sorry. He said, I just broke your treadmill. And I thought, OK. I said, well, let's go down and take a look at it. So he said, I'm really sorry, Nana. You're going to be so mad at me. <laughs> so we went down. All he had done was he had the, the little hand weight. And when he was on the treadmill, he dropped the hand weight, and it dented the frame a little bit. It didn't break it. I could still use it, the treadmill, it's just fine. And, and that's what I told him. I said, oh, honey, you didn't break this. This is fine. You, you just had him, you, you dropped it by accident. It was not a big deal. Um, first of all, thank you for telling me. I am so proud of you for telling me that you came and told me what you did. And so I didn't have to chastise him. I didn't have to tell him he was wrong. He did something right by telling me what he had what he had done, the, the mistake that he made or the accident that he had. I was so proud of him for that. But I want you to look at another video for just a minute and contrast Drew's um, maturity with somebody else's lack of maturity. isn't it? Oh dear. But, but Libby and our kids learned that uh, taking responsibility needs, needs a framework. And this is what we, taught, what we taught our kids. We taught them the five A's of peacemaking. First of all, Libby learned that she needed to admit what she did wrong without blaming, without making excuses, just to say, I admit I was wrong when. Unlike the fonts, she would apologize. The second A is to apologize for how she affected someone else. She needed to learn how to accept her consequences without arguing or without pouting. And depending on her choice, as I said earlier, if she made a sincere confession, um, then a person had the, had the responsibility then and even the right to say, I will give you mercy or justice. But at least Libby was starting to say, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to fight that anymore. She would ask for forgiveness. And then we would work together on how she was going to alter her choice in the future. And you know, once she began to apply the five A's more consistently in her life, I encouraged her to confess to people that she had hurt or offended. I told her I would go with her. She didn't have to do this alone that I would be her, I'd be her support system. And I said, who would you like to start with? I was really surprised when Libby told me that she wanted to make a public confession to her whole class. Now to me, that exhibited tremendous courage. I was so proud of that little girl. Here she was, seven years old, and she was going to make a public confession to her whole class. Her teacher agreed to give Libby the opportunity to speak to the kids. And they had already learned peacemaking because I had been in that classroom doing social and emotional learning lessons for them. 
I called Libby's mom and I told her what, what Libby and I had talked about doing and I said, how do you feel about that and would you give Libby permission to do that? And she said, absolutely. She said, please, please have her do that. I would love to have her do that with those kids and maybe that will help her build some better relationships. Her mom was very supportive. So together, Libby and I prepared her confession. And this is what she said. I admit I was wrong to be mean to you so much. Now to keep in mind, she's standing in front of her classroom, all of these little eyes, you know, 40 plus eyes watching her. She's standing there, I was sitting right next to her on a little second grade chair. <laughs> She said, I admit I was wrong to be mean to you so much. I called you names, hit you, yelled at you, and took your things. And Miss Nelson, I'm sorry I don't do my work good. I'm sorry for hurting everybody's feelings every day and for making you mad. I know it's my fault you don't like to play with me, and I have to miss recess to do my work all the time. Will you please forgive me? I want to be respectful and kind, and Mrs. Sandy's helping me. I'm going to work to be a good friend. I was so proud of Libby. That took an amazing amount of courage. I don't know about you, but I haven't heard that, that kind of a thorough confession from too many people. Have you? That, that's pretty amazing, don't you think, for a little seven-year-old? And what do you think the classroom's response was? Enthusiastic forgiveness. Those kids popped up out of their chairs, they ran up to the front of the room, they circled us, and the little girls were hugging Libby and saying, I forgive you, Libby, I forgive you. Want to play at recess? Even the little boys got into it. They were trying to high five her, you know. <laughs> it, was, it was just as sweet a moment as I could ever explain to you in a public school. It was beautiful. I wish I would have had it on camera just to tell, just to show people that it can be done. Libby started on a new beginning that day. Now she wasn't perfect, but she had a new beginning. Her relationships began to change because her choices began to change. Now one of the ways that I taught children how to do this and that, that they remember it was with the 5A way. And I'm going to show you this and then if you ever want to teach it to your kids and you can refer back to this and I, I hope since the words are there you don't really have to hear me but I'm going to show you how this all works. Okay. Admit I'm it. I broke the bond that's tightly fit. Apologize, tell no lies, I hurt you, I recognize. Accept, gladly kept, a consequence I won't forget. <laughs> Ask you, for we're through, forgiveness what I need from you. Alter now, this is how. God change, excuse me, I'll plan, ah, I'll plan to act, I'll do it now. Okay. So if you want to teach your kids, oh. <laughs> Oh, you guys are encouraging, thanks. <laughs> but if you want to teach your kids, that's one way that they can learn this and they can remember it. And, um, and the kids actually liked that. Now, once a child confesses, then it's important that they receive the gift of forgiveness. <laughs> And forgiveness is the heartbeat of peacemaking. Without it, it, I would suggest that it's nearly impossible to have a restored relationship, a completely restored relationship. When kids forgive in the same way that they want other people to forgive them, their, their relationships can actually start going down a healing road. But what does forgiveness really look like? We say that it's four, or a choice to make four promises. The first promise that we can give in any situation is this. I promise I will think good thoughts about you and I will do good for you. So the person that has, 
has done something to hurt me, I'm actually going to make this promise to that person. Now, this can be something as simple as um, speaking well of them to somebody else. It could be maybe helping them with their schoolwork. It could be helping a sibling with chores. It could be all kinds of different things that would be good that we could do for somebody who hurt us. But the next three promises, typically, we can give them if we want to, but the, the, these actually are more connected to, uh, to, the, to the confession. If somebody humbly confesses to us, these are more promises that we can give them. I promise I'm not going to bring this up and use it against you over and over and over and over again. So once I say forgive you, I'm going to let it be in the past. Number three, I promise I will not talk to others about what you did. Now this does not prohibit a child from getting help to work through a conflict with somebody that they trust. They might have to talk to somebody about that. There were times when, when um, I would forgive my kids, but I'd still want to talk to my husband about what had happened so he could understand what had happened during the day and support both them and me, if that makes sense. But this doesn't, it, but what this refers to is not random gossip. You know, kids and I shouldn't be going around to this person, 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 telling about how bad the other person was, all right? This says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to talk about this situation to other people. And then the fourth promise is, I promise I will be friends with you again. After our children sincerely forgave, excuse me, sincerely confessed to us, we communicated our forgiveness with a simplified version of these four promises. Good thought, hurt you not, gossip never, friends forever. And our children knew that when we said that, the walls of conflict came down, the distance shrunk, there was no more gap, and we were close again. The encouraging thing is that they did that with each other too, and they even did it with other friends. After Libby confessed and her classmates forgave her, she began to work on altering her choices in the future. You know, it's never too late for a person to start doing what's right. For Olympic athletes, in order to earn good medals, gold medals, they need to replace bad habits in their sport with good habits. In the same way, children who have made bad choices in the, in the past that has created conflict need to learn how to make good ones and continue to practice those. And what we want children to learn to do is to stay out of conflict. Now that S-T-A-Y is an acronym for STOP, THINK, ACT, YAY. Now this is in lesson nine, and I think we have time to cover it, so we're, we're going to go ahead with, with that. But first of all, the S just stands for stop. Stop and identify the wrong choice that you're tempted to make. And then T is to think. Think about other choices you could make instead. Make a list of all the possible choices in, a given, in that given situation. And then start thinking about the, cons um, the predictable consequences for those choices. Whenever kids did that with me, I'd always make sure that there was a bad choice on the list too. So as we looked at the, cho at the, at the choices and then we listed the consequences, they could see that, boy, if I do this, then I'm really going to get myself into trouble. But boy, if I do this, then it's going to work out better. So, and the nice thing is if you've got a list of good choices, you tell them to pick the best one, it might not be the best one that you think is, is, is going to be absolutely the best one, but if that's the one that they want to try, at least it's a good choice, so let's plan it. Let's develop an action plan and see what happens. And so that would be the next step, is to develop the action plan and then follow through with it, act on it. And then evaluate it. Did it work? How did it work? Did it solve the problem or did it create another conflict? If it, if it solved the problem, celebrate. Be joyful, be thankful. If it didn't, then you've got your list of other choices you can go back to. 
Now for those of you that do that um, want to use the manual, in the, in the back of, of this particular manual in the appendices, there are worksheets that you can use with a lot of these principles. And I would just have the kids go through that worksheet with me on the stay plan. And, and we come up with a lot of different ideas on how to, how to resolve conflict in the, fu in, the, in the future. Now Libby worked with me to develop these stay plans for months. And as she did, life started to change for Libby. Her relationships started to improve. She was experiencing increased academic progress. And even though she wasn't perfect, transformation was starting to take place. And by the end of the year, my little Libby was given the award for the most improved student in the class, or in the, in the school that year. Now that, that was from October to May. I, I started working with her in October. And by May, my little Libby got that award. I was so proud of her. We cried together on the last day of school. I had the blessing of working with Libby for another year when she was in third grade. And then they moved. So I don't know what happened to Libby after that. But my hope and my prayer is that Libby learned some things that year, or those two years, that even to this day, I hope, are giving her a, a solid footing in relationships. You know, if you choose to teach your children these principles, your very best teaching tool is going to be your example. As they watch you confess honestly and openly and without excuse, as they watch you forgive others in the same way you want to be forgiven, as they watch you communicate respectfully to, uh, to and about everyone in your life, especially them, they can learn to stay on top of that slippery slope and they can learn to live at peace with other people, at least as far as it depends on them. Nothing can teach your children more effectively than watching you put peacemaking principles into your into practice in your own life, whether it's not, or whether or not it's with your spouse or with your relatives, with your friends, possibly your coworkers or your neighbors, but especially with your children. They need, they need to know. They need to see you do this. Just beware of the do as I say and not as I do trap. Hypocrisy is a poor but a powerful teacher. So make sure that if, if they're seeing you, um, make sure your message is congruent with what, you, with what you do. Now, peacemakers in training is not a quick fix for a be child's behavior problems, and it won't turn your children into instant peacemakers. It takes a lot of work. Rather, it's simply a curriculum that promotes peacemaking as a part of a healthy lifestyle that not only resolves conflicts and benefits relationships, but it can also improve academic de development as well. The less time that needs to be spent intervening in conflicts, the more time can be spent on learning. And that's a good thing. It is my hope that, your, that, that this formula for success will help your children will help your children to learn how to get along with other people in life and that they can experience success because of their relational skills. I hope that they will be able to also experience the joy and the triumph of living as a peacemaker in their lives.